perhaps just a couple of reasons why people do transitions. Um, I watch people who've invested enormous amount of energy in their study careers, and they've ended up in places where they simply don't like what they're doing. Um, and a lot of the work that we do that at the Graduate School of Business often has professionals that have just reached a crossroad that says this no longer works for me. And in fact, we found that those that particularly hate what they do are the medical profession. We get a couple of lawyers, a lot of people in media who simply say, I don't want to be doing this anymore. I never enjoyed it. The other reason people are involved in transition are often we find that women make some of their best career decisions late 20s, early 30s. Um, in fact, I saw two women in a row one day, and they're both 28. And what we've noticed is that women often make really good career decisions end of 20s, early 30s. And they drop psychology and get into IT and drop IT and start their own businesses. Men, as you know, are a bit slower, so it takes a while. And <laughs> they start pitching here about early 30s, mid 30s. In fact, we have a new retreat called something about 39. Um, and so for men, there's almost a critical space that by 39, you've either resolved your career or you've resolved that this isn't what you want to do. The other thing that we see is uh, a lot of people in their mid-50s um, have had this dream of retiring early or this dream of you know, having more financial security. And they do then retire for a year or two and then simply decide, I can't do this for another two years. And we're watching people in their 50s starting businesses and doing work that probably is giving them more energy than anything they've done in their lives before. Um, there's a lovely book written by Bob Buford called Half Time. And he says that our lives are like a soccer game, that the first half of our lives are about success whatever that might mean for you. And the second half is about significance. And so we're seeing people hit mid-50s and saying, I really want to be significant. I want to be doing something that gives back to people. I want to be doing something that makes me get out of bed in the morning. And so we're seeing people in the second half of their lives do some really incredible things with their careers that they never dreamt of at 30. We're also seeing people in late retirement that are suddenly finding they have a new lease on life. I had a call from someone who is 70 who said that when he looks at the genetics of his family, they all lived about 95, and he says, I've got 25 years, and, and I'm simply not going to watch Unit Trust go up and down for 25 years, so <laughs> I, I want a new career, and I think we've been seeing people doing that. The, the other thing that's happening in the formal workplace is that because jobs are no longer as, as static as they used to be, people are changing careers many times inside of organizations. Not only are they changing, organizations are changing, jobs are changing, and they're morphing into different shapes. So even though people may stay in what looks like a similar job in a similar organization, they're in fact doing five or six different careers at one time. Then, of course, there's the great field that I have a great passion for and spend a lot of time working with organizations is what we call involuntary career transition. And those are people that suddenly find themselves in a place where their jobs are no longer required in the organization. So the number of retrenchments we've been busy with in South Africa the last couple of years have just been phenomenal. Um, I'm busy with a large merger right now in South Africa where literally thousands of people are in a place where their jobs may not be required and so they're having to look at new opportunities in the organization, some people outside. The MBA groups, of course, are classic career change spaces. Um, we, at the last um, full-time MBA class at GSB, we asked them how many of you are here because you want to change careers and the hands were easily 90, 95% of them. Uh, my next question was, how many of you know exactly what you're going to do now? And there were kind of a few hands in the top left-hand corner. So often people are embarking on a further education, often it's an MBA, and then saying, what do I do with this? What do I really want to do? I have more knowledge, but I'm not quite sure what to do with it. So I think transition comes in different packages, and you may be here because you're either contemplating one, or because you're close to someone who's also contemplating one. We're also seeing transition in a slightly different way, and I'll chat about that later, is that many people are starting to develop more than one business card. Um, you simply don't only have to have one career. You can have five at the same time. Um, there's nothing preventing you from doing consulting and writing and doing graphic work and you know, organizing people's weddings and running a guest house. Um, and so it's looking for different income streams and different areas of interest. It's interesting for me that when I work with people in organizations um, and executives, probably what has to be one of the most common dilemmas, if you like, in careers is that they simply bored. They're looking for more challenge. Um, they're what we call underutilized. And it's interesting that being underutilized is a whole lot more stressful than being too busy. And so people are saying, I work really well, I get really well paid, I have a really good BM, I get a good package. I'm just only using half my head. I'm only bringing half of what I really think I could do. I'm using half my intellect. If people would use my brains as well as my body, you know, imagine what I could do for them. 
So, you know, there's a, <laughs> I think there's a, there's a great space where people's transitions are in fact just looking for more. They want more out of their work and, and I'm seeing a whole lot more of that. So, this evening I want to chat about three things in particular. Um, the first is why transition has become almost an imperative inside of our modern working world. In other words, why are we doing them at all? The second thing I want to talk about is how do you find out or how do you begin to find out what you really want to do with your career? And it's, for me, it's quite frightening how few people have never asked the question. Many people that I work with who are being retrenched often say, this has come at the right time for me, but I, I have never asked these questions of what I love doing and what I'd like to do on a daily basis. And the third thing I want to talk about is how we job hunt. We read the newspapers, we see we've lost another million jobs, we see the job creation isn't working so well, we know that organizations are downsizing, and so how do we job hunt in a world without jobs um, as we see it? Why transitions become critical? Um, I suppose I've got to the stage where I can start quoting myself. So <laughs> I, I think one of the things <laughs> that I want to say is that I really believe our work is an important part of our lives. Um, I don't think work is just an appendage. It's not what we do from nine to five. It gives us an opportunity to make a difference, to learn, to meet great people, to grow and to know that our time has been useful. Um, so work is not an appendage for me. It, it's a critical part of our well-being. Um, somebody in psychological society was saying that if you're unhappy in your work, the chances are you may not be happy in your life. And you know, I think it's something that for those people who value their work and value contribution may well be true. Of course, if you look at Robert Sharma, who's quite topical right now, he wrote, the secret of happiness is simple. Find out what you truly love to do and then direct all your energy towards doing it. If you study the happiest, healthiest, most satisfied people of our world, you'll see that each and every one of them has found their passion in life and then spent their days pursuing it. This calling is almost always one that in some way serves others. If you think it's a bit of a modern version, those of you that tuned into the royal wedding recently, would have heard that they started the sermon with uh, St. Catherine of Siena, who said, be who God meant you to be, and you will set the world on fire. She was born in 1347, so that's kind of old news. Um, <laughs> but I think it's, I, I, I'm more and more hearing people say to me they really want to do what gives them energy. And I have this, I mean, just, just imagine in South Africa, if people that were excited about getting your car running smoothly were working on your car, and people who love pizzas were making them and people who were, who were good at engineering and building bridges, I, I really think we would have trouble holding our economy down. I think we wouldn't have service issues because people would be doing things that they really felt something about. I put in one more that's one of my favorites. Um, Longile mentioned a book called What Colors Your Parachute. It was written by a man called Dick Bowles, um, who's now 83-ish, I think, um, and I've done a fair amount of work with him in the States. He was a pastor and uh, when they started closing down churches in, in the States, there were many ministers without work. And what he did is he started a, an, if you like, a research project to help them find work in the open market. He, he, because he comes from the, um, from the Christian church, that's the perspective he writes from, and I don't mean that to be your belief, but it certainly is, is his. And he wrote on how to find your mission in life. He said, God made you unique, as your fingerprints attest. God calls you to be born so that you might contribute to life here on earth, something that no one else can contribute in quite the same way. And this is your mission in life. And he talks about the fact there are three missions, and, and one is to first of all get to know the missioner and to know God. The second is to find ways to make the world a better place, and I've put part of it on the slide for you. But he says your second mission here on earth is also one which you share with the rest of the human race. But it is no less your individual mission for the fact that it is shared. And that is to do whatever you can, moment by moment, day by day, to make this world a better place, following the leading and guidance of God's spirit within and around you. In every situation you find yourself, to do whatever you can that will bring more gratitude, more kindness, more forgiveness, more honesty, and more love into this world. And the third part of your mission is uniquely yours, and that is to exercise the talent that you particularly came to earth to use, your greatest gift which you most delight to use in the place or places or setting and settings that the world most needs. And if, if I think back to my school days and to my days at UCT even, I don't remember anybody saying to me, what is it that you really want to do to make the world a better place? What is the stuff that gives you energy? What are your best skills? What are the things that you most delight to do? And what are the things that allow you to lose track of time? So as, as, as I'm looking at midlifers, and I have to say that I don't work with young people, I typically work with people who've hit late 20s who've discovered that their careers aren't working, I'm hearing more and more people say, I'm looking for work that's significant for me. 
I don't just want a job. I don't just want to be paid because everyone gets paid. But I want to do something that means something to me. And so I think when Dick starts talking about making the world a better place, I think we all have responsibility to do that um, in whichever part of the world we find ourselves. As a result, part of the reason that transition is important right now is because there's a new deal in the formal workplace. I grew up with grandparents that said to me, if you want a really good job and really good security, you need to get into the public service or join an insurance company or a bank. And I have to tell you, the number of retrenchments we've been doing in that field over the last 10 years has been uh, phenomenal, and I don't have to tell you that. So suddenly, we're in the space where job for life is no longer guaranteed, not in large organizations. I'm working with an organization right now where people have been there for 22, 25 years, and suddenly they were being told, we don't need you anymore. It's kind of a scary space because they're all baby boomers or you know, older than us. Um, and they've simply understood that as long as you didn't do anything wrong, you'd be there for life. The other thing is that careers are, there are many more careers and employment relationships in our lifetime. So people are doing three, five, seven or more careers or more at the same time. Careers are more lateral. lateral. So we're moving across organizations as structures flatten. More than one employer. Many people are designing more than five business cards or at least five. William Bridges, if you've read, there's a great book that he wrote called Job Shift. In fact, the subtitle of the book is How to Survive in a World Without Jobs. And he says that we're in the second great job shift of the world. The, great, the first great job shift was Industrial Revolution, where people lived on farms. You know, the shop was downstairs and you lived upstairs, or you lived on farms and you made things. Um, we then entered this, if you like, this world of jobs. We're now in a space where we're de-jobbing. Um, outsourcing doubles every two years, according to... Andrew Levy. Um, we're watching organizations getting smaller. We're watching outsourcing happening. We're watching large call centers that are simply um, outsourced um, to people that aren't employees. So he said that there are essentially three new skills or three new competencies that are required in the new workplace. And I think they're really important. The first is employability. You've simply got to be employable. And employable doesn't mean that you have a job. In other words, the new job security is not having a job, but being employable and having what it what employers are looking for. What employers are looking for is not only skills, they're also looking for attitudes. I'm hearing more and more CEOs say to me, if you can find people with the right attitudes, we can teach them. But don't bring us with people's skills that we simply don't get on with and people we don't like and people we don't want to see tomorrow. The, um, the, uh, the second thing is vendor-mindedness. In other words, we're not in a mindset that is about being a vendor. That whether you're in a permanent relationship um, with an employer, whether you're not, you've got to start thinking about how do I keep marketing myself, remarketing myself in the same organization. The fact that I have a desk and a seat in the parking bay doesn't guarantee that I'll be there tomorrow. And the third one is resilience. And resilience work is, is starting to do some really, really nice stuff out there. Resilience is about being able to get your security from within rather than without. Resilience is also about being able to bend without breaking. It's being able to deal with change. And a lot of the work that I'm doing with HR professionals now is helping people deal with change um, that they simply never had to do before. So if you look at the New Deal, and, and just in case you think this is all theoretical, here's something written by Apple Corporation, which I think you know, puts it really well, and since Apple is quite topical right now. They say, here's the deal Apple will give you. Here's what we want from you. We're going to give you a really neat trip while you're here. We're going to teach you stuff you couldn't learn anywhere else. We expect you to work like hell. Buy the vision as long as you're here. We're not interested in employing you for a lifetime, but that's not the way we're thinking about this. It's a good opportunity for both of us, but it's probably finite. And if you look at, at, at General Electric, they just say the only job security is a successful business, and it's what we're seeing in South Africa too. Now, in South Africa, I'm not seeing corporations bluntly state that, but it's what they're doing, and it's what they using people like ourselves and other consultants in the business to help people understand that there's a new turf, there's a new way of operating, there's a new way of thinking about work, that career transition is no longer left for people who are unhappy at 39. Transition is actually part of the deal. It's the way you think about careers in organizations and beyond. So if you're thinking about that you're in the wrong career, the chances are that you, you're not alone. The second part of what I want to talk about is how do you work out what you want to do? If you look at the number of job titles that are out there, life is simply not long enough to try them out. There's what's called a dictionary of occupational titles, which is published in the United States, that has about 20,000 job titles in it. 
if you add to that the Deloitte's list here, the lists of jobs inside of corporations, the jobs that we keep creating, you know, maybe we're up to 40,000 or more. Um, and yet we still sit sometimes, I think back in the school system, where there were only five careers and we all chose one of them. You know, it was either law, medicine, engineering, teaching, or you became a minister, or you know, what else was on your five list. I chose law, which I did at UCT undergrad, and vowed I wouldn't go back to that. So it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's not useful anymore to talk about job titles um, or ask what you want to be. We've now got to ask what you want to do. And so the heart I've given you, and I think the heart, based on what I've said till now, is, is becoming a more appropriate model for looking at careers. And you'll see that a, a career has an anatomy. Um, you can split the heart down the middle, and, and the left side of the heart is essentially, what do you want to do? In other words, the kind of questions we'd be asking about that would be, what do you love doing? What are the things that allow you to lose track of time? What are the tasks that you do that even if someone pay, didn't pay you to do, you'd probably find an opportunity to use them, whether they're in the community, whether they're inside of your work environment, maybe they're part of your giving work. But it's finding the skills we love using. So often the questions are, what do you love working with? Or what kind of information do you like working with? Now, if you look at the do well and love doing, it's an endless list. It could be working with strategy, developing projects, working with people, mentoring people, setting up new ventures, designing legal systems, setting up organizations, managing change, leading, working with your hands, making things, designing pottery, using your hands for massage. It's, it's virtually an endless list. And the question we need to keep asking is, what is the stuff that you love doing? Not do you want to study, what do you want to be ultimately, but what does that job hold? And then what we're helping people is based on that is to understand how jobs look. Now, many of the people that we find, and I'm talking about midlifers and GSB type environment, that hate their jobs, have typically studied something that fascinates them. But when they get there, they simply don't like it. I had a call the other day from, and incidentally, some people know this quite early on while they're studying. A psychiatrist phoned me the other day and said, I can't do this another day. And I said to him, <laughs> just, <laughs> I said, just kind of talk me through when did you know this wasn't working? <laughs> and he said, well, while I was studying medicine at UCT, he said I knew it was wrong for me, but I was the only kid that was bright enough to go to, to do medicine, so I was the doctor in the family. So I said, so each year did you, you know, kind of know? He said, no, I knew that was wrong. So he said, when I graduated, I realized the only safe haven would be psychiatry, because there, <laughs> there was no blood. He says, this is worse than blood by 100 miles. <laughs> so... <laughs> um, <laughs> And I, I think the question again begs it is to, you know, if we start asking questions about what do you love to do, then we start making career decisions as opposed to study decisions. I watch people who are in law. We had a, a lawyer in a recent program at the GSB who said, uh, he said, I hate law. And our question was, how long have you been in law? And he said, 25 days. <laughs> uh, now, he got himself into a really good law firm in Cape Town. And as you know, there's a glut of LLB. So to get into good articles is not so easy. So having got into a law firm says, I don't want to do this. Um, I said to him, what do you really want to do? And he said, well, you know, I want to be a vet. <laughs> um, and you can see there were other questions that we asked after that. But <laughs> um, we're finding more and more with young people, with older people, that the questions really giving us answers is help us understand what you're good at. Help us understand what gives you energy. Help us understand what gives you a sense of losing track of time, that when you're doing it, it's almost not work. And you know there's an old definition of careers that, you know, careers are really about doing what you love doing, getting someone to pay you to do it. And, and I think that's still true. The other side of the heart speaks to a different part. And it's, the other side of the heart speaks to where you want to be using your skills. Now, if you look at the bottom right-hand corner, it's about the field you want to work in. Now, often in traditional career speak, somebody will say that an interest dicta dictates where you go with your career. Interests are really more of a feeling than they are about what you do. In other words, one has a feeling for something, one has passion for something. It's the conversations that you'll have deep into the night. It's the, it's the topics that you'd like to look up on the internet. It's the books that you love reading. It's the magazines you can't leave alone. It's the kind of people you'd like to, if you got stuck in a cocktail party with someone, you'd hope they'd talk about that. In other words, field is often dictates where I want to be involved in the world of work. And if you took the yellow pages and, and page through it, that would typically indicate a lot of fields of work. If you looked at even curriculum inside of universities, they each dictate a field. What you do in that field could be different. Um, an example is that uh, a CEO of a small 
um, housing loan company who was in the throes of you know, being retrenched and phoned me and said, you know, what do I do now? Now what happened is that in fact one of his passions, and I'm talking now about field, is about food. And so what he did was for the next three years was to open a restaurant. Now when I looked at what he did and, and did well, he's good at developing strategy, very good at developing marketing, recruiting people, managing contacts. He was managing financial products. He was managing financial management. In other words, the skills that he used, he simply took into a different field. He didn't go to the kitchen. He opened a really good restaurant that within two years was one of the top 15 gourmet restaurants in the country. In other words, what he's done is merely move into a different field with the same skills. He's now since made another transition and is now doing some superb strategy work for the government um, and is using the same strategic skills but now in the area of, of policy development. So, you know, once you can start separate field from what you do, you can also realize that if you studied medicine, that doesn't mean that you have to be a GP if that's not your style. It means there are a hundred other things you could be doing inside of the medical field without dumping the field entirely. The third part of the heart is what we call peripheral conditions. Now, peripheral suggests in a way that they're on the outside, and I'm finding more and more that they're not as peripheral as they seem. But peripheral are typically about where we work. In other words, it's the geographic location. It's the culture of the organization. It's the people we work with. It's the working conditions we work under. Um, really, uh, recently chatted to another medical specialist who says the conditions of work, the hours, the working in a half dark ICU area is simply not sustainable for him and he needs to do something more useful or in a different environment. Always on call, um, never has a personal life. So peripheral conditions are often about working conditions. They're often about pay. They're often about the kind of things that you need in your environment that give you satisfaction in your work. For some people that's challenge. For some it's life balance. For other people it's about specializing and they're in general management positions. For others the fact that they're in a specialist position they really want to be managing the whole, the whole shooting match. So often peripheral when we analyze why people's careers aren't working, they may well be doing exactly what they need to be doing. They may be in exactly the right field, they're simply in the wrong place or the wrong organization at the wrong point in time and it could really be moving that. So when you look at the kind of moves that people can make inside of careers, sometimes it could be that you keep doing what you've been doing because you enjoy it, but you merely take it to a different field. Other people may well stay in the same field, but decide they want a different role inside of those field. And for others, maybe starting their own business. So the heart, if you like, is, is a different way of thinking about careers where you start piecing it together. I often hear people saying, what are good careers that are out there right now? And you can see the answer is no longer what's out there. The question is what's in there. In other words, what do I have that I really want to be doing? And then how do I find people that need that? How do I find organizations that are looking for what I do? Or how do I find clients that are looking for the things that, that really give me energy? Often the real challenge, well, there's a slide you might enjoy. Um, it's one uh, that is designed by Dick Bowles. But it has a kind of a nice sense of where the paths might take you. So you'll see what's interesting is as you come in the path at the bottom, it's about staying where you live now or moving to a new place. And he's often said to me that one of your most important career decisions is where you live. Um, whether that's here, whether it's Australia, whether it's London, whether it's Johannesburg makes a difference. And I often question that, but I watch more and more people going through transition in the corporate workplace and saying, you know, I don't do Durban, we have extended family, we're not moving from Cape Town. So that may be important for you. But as you move into that, you could stay in your, in your same career, you can start a new career, you can work part-time, you can work for yourself, you can change organizations. And I think often when I'm working with, with people in transition, it's that we're not looking at all the options. Um, we're simply saying, I hate this, so, you know, how can I stop? One of the reasons I see people not making transitions is this complete fear about finding another job or about finding a job at all. Um, and I thought this was kind of a good way to start. I think that's where some people want to put up on their walls when they start job hunting. And I'm working with a lot of people that are job hunting right now. If you can't read that from there, it says place kit on firm surface. Um, follow directions in circle of kit. I repeat step two as necessary or until unconscious. If unconscious, see stress reduction activity. <laughs> um, and I think that's where I'm seeing people start to job hunt, getting completely frantic, getting really panicky, either because they're being retrenched or because they are in jobs that are literally killing their souls on a daily basis. Um, people who are on medication that are simply utterly unhappy with what they're doing but simply can't see themselves defining other work. 
so I want to chat to you for a few minutes and that's the second part I want to talk about tonight is job hunting. What's interesting is that only about 15% of jobs are advertised in what we call the open market. The open market is what we call newspapers, ads, agencies, sitting with recruitment companies or on the internet. In other words, if you're looking for them, they're visible in any of those places. What that means, of course, is that 85% of jobs are in the hidden job market. Now, the hidden job market are jobs that change hands inside of organizations. They change hands inside of alumni groups. They're people who get referred to other people. Um, I certainly have never had a job inside of the open market. They've always been either by people I know or people have been in organizations or people have had opportunities that have appealed to me. So the hidden job market is enormous. Um, and yet, because people don't know that, they're looking at the open market and saying, well, there's either nothing out there or there's nothing out there that I want. If you look at the way people typically look for jobs, 95% of people use traditional job hunting methods. What that means is they draw up CVs, they attach their photographs, you know, do some work on what font works well, how many pages, so on. They also look at the ads, they look at the newspapers, and they look at recruitment agencies. Of course, the 5% that are left that know exactly what they want, that know what they're good at, that know what kind of employers would be looking for them, who are able to verbalize coherently what they do, as opposed to I'm a finance person, read my mind. Um, <laughs> you know, what they really do is they have access to the entire hidden market. In other words, they can go to any job they want to. You can walk into any organization. And if you look at the way organizations, the financial markets do, they don't wait for people to phone them in the yellow pages. They simply approach people and saying, my name is Pete, and the reason I'm here is this is what I do, and I wonder if you need someone like me. So as we work with that, you can see that one way of working with transition is also being able to identify clearly what you're looking for so that you can access the hidden job market, um, which is the chance of where the jobs are sitting right now. I want to show you a most fascinating diagram. It's called upside down job hunting, and it talks to how employers fill vacancies. Now, just for clarity, an employer is anybody who pays you for what you do. So it could be a corporation, it could be a business, it could also be a client. It, in other words, anyone that buys your services. Now, if you look from the top, the most common way that employers fill vacancies is from within. Within either could mean people in the organization. We know you've managed one part of the country for us and we can move you to elsewhere. But within is also ex-employees, consultants, people who've worked on a casual basis, people that you know. In other words, within is that inner circle of people that you've met, people you've seen what they do, they don't put their hand in the till, you know, they pitch on time, they have a good attitude and they deliver what, what they say they do. Now, when that doesn't work, often employers will fill vacancies on the second line with people who approach them. Now, if that's with proof, that's often helpful. If somebody says, I do really good photography, it would be helpful to bring a portfolio with you. Um, you know, I, I do good IT programs, put your finger on the screen, it'll read your horoscope. Is, is a whole lot more compelling than I do wonderful stuff, it'll change your life. Um, what do you pay? So the, the, the approach stuff is really helpful, and that's often a new sense of, of job hunting in the world of work. The third one is when we don't fill vacancies internally. In other words, there's no one we know, there's no one that's already in the organization, no one's approached us, what do we do? We hit the network. We say, who do you know? Who do you know that's good at IT, good data management, someone who's been around, someone who's good at tax law, someone who understands payroll systems, someone who's good at HR but, you know, doesn't take prisoners? It's, it says, phone Mari. That's who we know. And we do that in our personal lives. If you want to build a carport, what do you do? You look at the guy over the road to say, you just built one, who built that for you? Providing it's standing, all the rubble's been taken away. In other words, there's a, there's a space where we ask people that we know, do you know a good psychologist? Do you know someone I can refer my daughter to? Do you know someone who's a good GP? I've just moved to Cape Town. It's how the world works. So typically when we fill vacancies, we're looking to work with a network. When that doesn't work, employers then are forced to go to agencies. Now, agencies mean you have to find an agency that understands your organization, understands the culture, is likely to understand job, the job specs well enough, but also it's going to cost you. And if you're looking at senior management positions, you're looking at 500K upwards. Um, it doesn't come free. Many organizations, therefore, are putting their own ads in. So you look at the Sunday Times and the Tribune and the Star and uh, many of them on the Internet is looking at ads. Now, from an employer's point of view, of course, when you put ads in, a downside is that you get you know, 92 CVs faxed through. Um, and you now need to start asking the same questions, sorting out, you know, who can do what they say and who isn't and who's lying and who do you want to put in place. 
Not only that, but if you reject 89 people and three think that you've discriminated because you know they may have looked pregnant or they may have had a you know disability of some kind, you may need to defend those for a couple of weeks since you have nothing else to do. Um, and as you know, as an employer, you have to prove that you didn't discriminate. So it's a fair amount of work um, that goes with the own recruitment. Bottom of the line, the least favorite way of employing people is CVs. And what I mean by CVs is unsolicited CVs, the stuff that arrive in flat brown envelopes in your desk. Now, I've just worked with a group of HR professionals last week. Um, I, used to, I used to say it was 99% of them go in the bin. It's now 99.5%. They simply don't even pass sides. They either go into file 13. Some of them have a cabinet where they store them for two, three weeks, and then they dump them. But people simply don't want other people's CVs. Um, they're not useful. They don't tell you what you do. I, I also want to just for a minute, if I can be rude about CVs, if you, if you look at this, the average CV, assuming that you have nothing to do, so you do open this flat round envelope, and you have a look, what does the front page typically look like? It may have a tasteless picture in the right-hand corner, and I mean a scroll of some kind. It may be their photograph, too. Um, and then it has standard information like, you know, Joanna, your, your Jakub, Wilhelmina, Hermina, like a, like a christening. You know, it's, it's got all your names on it. Then it's got addresses so that you can deliver a gift. And then it's got things like ID numbers for numerologists and health status like a medical aid application and number of kids for the, for the annual Christmas party and it, a driver's license for an administrative position. It, it, in other words, all the front page of a CV tells you is this isn't a corpse. I've, I've often said to people that, that, you know, if you, that if you, if you have a heart attack late at night and you need to check into Constantiaburg, just take your CV with you. Just make sure that your, that your medical aid number's on the bottom of it because it's all you need to check into hospital. It's, what people do then is they move to the second page where they now talk about a history of what they've done the last, you know, 32 years, 1939 to 1948. Shell Company and they list duties and then we go, you know, 1948 to 1969. Um, Caltex oil and we list those. On the last page, that's if you've got that far. There's a, there's a statistic a couple of years ago that a CV gets read for 60 seconds before it gets turfed. That's down to about 30 seconds now. So, you know, if the front page doesn't grab you, you need a fair amount of resilience to get through it. But often on the last page, they hope there's a bit of light work, so it's called special interests or special achievements. You know, netball captain 1942. And, <laughs> and, and then it, and then it it may have a section called interests, um, like hiking, reading, seven de you know, <laughs> whatever happens to be on there. So do we end up with these perfectly useless documents people don't want? So if you look at the way the arrow going up on the other side of the diagram, I think that's what's relevant, is that when people start looking at our career options or looking at what's out in the marketplace, the first thing they do is, is draw up CVs. We get calls about what font works best and should their photograph be on it. Um, it's, it simply doesn't matter. The second thing they do is hit the ads. <coughs> and what I've just said about the ads is that even if you do hit the ads, you're still only hitting 15% of the market. I was on a, a panel discussion at Gibbs recently, and uh, Mahadeeb, who manages MD Selection, was saying that that 15% in executive positions is down to about 6%. So if you do correct maths, it's kind of 94% uh, of executive positions are simply passing hands without passing through the open market. That doesn't mean they don't get advertised, but it doesn't determine that you're going to get the job. So what we're needing people to work with, um, even if they're working with agencies, is that agencies are holding a very small part of the job market. In fact, recruitment agencies have been through a really tough two years um, because their clients are corporations. Many of them are not hiring at all, and many of them are doing it themselves or getting people from within the internal networks. So one of the tricks, if a trick it be, is to help people network more actively. And by networking, I don't mean hitting every cocktail party clutching a Coke. It's, it really is about networking intelligently inside of new fields, inside of the field you may want to be involved in, with people that have information about jobs that might interest you, with people who have connections with people that do. But it's not simply floating around. It's deciding very clearly that you want to be in the medical field, and therefore what part of the medical field, and therefore what kind of people would be helpful to have conversations with. We need people to approach organizations. And, and we've seen many cases of people approaching an organization where even though a job doesn't exist, they take people because they have passion and energy and because they have a contribution to make. Even if they go on in a part-time basis, on a voluntary basis, they get themselves within the system. Which means that when you get to the top of the triangle, it's about getting within. It's about getting within networks. It's about getting within organizations. 
even if the position you want isn't the perfect position first round, it's about getting into a field, um, even if it's not a position. One of the, this is a, just a lovely process. It, uh, it's designed by Daniel Poirot, which, who is the job hunting expert in Europe. It's also well documented in what colors your parachute if you want more information about it. It's called the Pi model. And the Pi model is, is really a process of finding the work that you want. And I'm gonna suggest we work backwards. So starting on the right hand side, there is always a conversation with a potential employer, and it's really called the employment interview. Now, I was working with a group of HR people this week, and I was amazed how few of them could actually verbalize what they do well. They just assumed that people would know that. So one of the, some of the things one needs to be able to verbalize quite clearly is why you're here. I watch people saying, you know, I went for this amazing interview, but I discovered it was with a beer company. You mean you didn't know it was a beer company? No, well, I just got referred to this job. I didn't know where it was. In other words, there was no rationale for why they were there, the contribution they wanted to make, why that employer any, as opposed to any other. So th there's a sense of needing to know why you're going somewhere, not just pitching on the doorstep and say, well, you know, my car broke down. I thought, well, <laughs> hell, you know, if I'm done pharmaceuticals, I guess I could do beer. Um, or, you know, people getting on the fifth floor of a building and saying, well, IT, you know, I haven't tried that before, so let's do that now. It's, it's a, a far more focused process about where you want to be. It's also about being able to verbalize what you can do. Um, I asked someone yesterday who was involved in IT, what is it that you're going to offer to the new organization? And they're in the process of retrenchment. She said, well, I'm really good at communicating needs. What do you mean by that? No, well, you know how IT works. So do you write specs? Do you do that? Do you do tests? Now I do all of that. Then tell someone. It's, it's simply that people can't read your mind. So it's often helping people crystallize more clearly what it is you do. Not what you studied, not where you've been, not the fact you have two dogs, dogs and been divorced. It's about what can you do for me. The third one is what kind of person are you? And increasingly employers want to know two things. What can you do and what kind of person are you? In other words, can you add value and do we want you around? I told a group a couple of months ago we were doing a career workshop for the day. I think George, you'd remember. And I said, you know, this whole job planning thing is like dating. Some of them looked a bit shocked. But this is a dating game. Um, you know, it's sitting in front of somebody and you asking, do I want to see this person again? And an employment interview is no more than checking whether it's someone that you want to have around, someone that you'd like in your organization, provided, of course, they can do what you want to. All of employment conversations come with referrals for other people that may need what we do. It's also asking, do you need someone like me? And I'm watching people drifting around, not asking the question and saying, we had a really good interview. I'm not sure where they're going to get back to me. Did you ask where they need someone like you? No, well, I thought that was a bit pushy. You know, what if they say no? Then you ask who else might need someone like you. It, you know, it's simply a question. It's not about being rude or arrogant, but it's taking charge of the process. The information phase is, a, is, is an interesting one because the lawyer I mentioned earlier is wanted to be a vet. You know, we, we asked him how he came to make a decision to get into law when he wanted to be a vet. And he'd gone on doing some of what I think are now called shadowing interviews or informational interviews. And he'd spoken to two vets. You know, one said he works more with dog food and the other one said, if you want to do decent research, you need to you know, be working at Ornestaport. So on the basis of talking to two vets, he decides to study law. And we're watching people not doing empirical research on careers. Um, we're suggesting you do 30 or 40 conversations to check whether that's really what you want to be doing before you go you know, plowing into a five-year degree and then saying medicine doesn't work for me. Um, the practice phase is really around helping people get more comfortable with conversations. And we often send groups out to speak to businesses that are merely interesting for them. So whether those are funeral parlors, whether they're coffee shops, whether they're antique shops. Um, the criteria is this is not a career choice. Um, just gonna have some fun conversations and once we've got your left brain to understand this is not life threatening, we can start doing some informational interviews in the field that you really want to go to. And those are some of the questions um, that are, uh, stand, if you like, more standard questions. You can obviously add your own, but often the questions on an informational interview, how did you get into this kind of work? What do you enjoy most about it? What are the things that don't work for you? What are the trends? If I had to get into this field, what's happening that wasn't happening before? And if so, what would opportunities be for me if I wanted them? And of course, referrals. I think what for me is so interesting about the job hunting methodology is that there is a system. It's not just floating around the marketplace, posting 100 CVs to people who you think you know and hoping that someone will get back to you. We're watching people sitting at home for months um, and saying that no one's simply getting back to them. 
And it's not that they not keen, it's not that they're not making an effort. They're simply just getting depressed because they don't have a plan, they're not sure why it's not working, and they're not sure why what they're doing isn't delivering the results they'd hope it did. Um, and so there is a, there's a place for that. It would be unfair to talk about transition without referring to the fact that change takes energy. Change is quite tough, and I'm watching many people who, if you look at the uh, the guys and girls on the top left-hand corner of the, of, the, of the loop, is really where life is quite predictable. Uh, it doesn't mean you're happy with your career or your waistline or your relationships. It merely means that if you pitch at work, your desk is still there. And if you get home, uh, things are as they were when you left them. So as people go into a cycle of change, whether that's retrenchment, whether it's loss, whether it's making your own decision, it still throws people into a, a place of turmoil. And it's to, help you, it's, it's to help you understand that that's normal. People feel anger, people feel fear, they feel anxiety, they often feel blame, they often feel guilt, they often have a sense of anticipation but wonder why they feel awful the next day. In other words, there's an up and downness that comes with the change. And it's not only being prepared but it's also realizing that that's normal. Many people who enter a transition end up at that space at the bottom where I put question marks on top of someone's head. It's really a place of confusion and chaos where I hear people saying, what on earth was I thinking? <laughs> Um, I had a good secure job and now I'm sitting at home in a home office wondering, you know, what I lost on the way. And it's really about, I've put some things on the right hand side that I think are some things that we're certainly working with in corporations. And one is to help people give themselves permission for the turmoil that comes with change. Whether it's voluntary, whether it's involuntary, whether you decide to start a business, whether you don't. There's permission to say I'm allowed to have good days and bad days and good minutes and bad minutes and minutes where I wonder whether I was sane or whether I wasn't. It's about actively investigating alternatives and it's about taking initiative to investigate them and it's not two conversations, it's 40. It's four conversations a day for 10 days before we even slow down. It's about carpet weaving. I'm gonna talk about carpet weaving now, but I get calls from somebody to say, how do I jump? You know, I'm wondering where on earth they wanna jump from. Um, but what they want to do is jump out of a job that may you know, be adequately secure into nothingness. And you simply don't jump into nothingness, not unless you're into high risk and it gives you a real buzz. But for the rest of the human race, it's about weaving a carpet slowly. It's about putting things in place. It's about building connections. It's about building a, things that you can eventually climb onto a carpet that really can fly. And lastly, it's about being willing to learn as you go. Um, we don't go into change knowing all the answers. Um, and when we think we do, it proves us wrong. So it does come with change and I think it's a fun part of the journey. Um, but I think it's often something that people are not prepared for. I think part of carpet weaving for me is that one of my favorite quotations is Paul Tournier, who wrote, God guides us when we're on the way, not when we're standing still. And I'm seeing people that are simply stuck um, because they're not starting the process. Whether that process is researching jobs, whether it's about trying things out on what we call a freebie basis, whether it's about interviewing people that are doing different roles you might want to consider, whether it's about starting an educational project. It's about starting that so that people have the opportunity to meet with you. And it's interesting how often as you start walking, you meet people on planes that just happen to be sitting next to you and things come your way and suddenly talks that you needed to hear, you know, appear. And I think there's a lot about starting the process. That doesn't mean resigning on a Friday afternoon in a huff. Um, it means starting a process of research. And so carpet weaving for me has many things. It's about, sometimes it's about researching new roles. Um, and I think often we don't know how to do that or we're not doing enough of it. It's about sometimes making a transition move. It might be moving into a different field of work, but doing the same work that you're doing now. So if you're an accountant in banking and you're looking to get into corporate governance in the pharmaceutical industry, there's nothing wrong with moving into pharmaceuticals even in an accounting position, in order to learn the ropes, in order to work out, work out how that industry works before you develop new skills. It's about physical space. I met with someone recently who's wanted to start a business, and I said to him, why don't you use your back room, paint it yellow, put in a, a phone, put in a bookshelf, and he said it was, it was kind of an amazing space for him that suddenly he had a business because he had a physical space that he could start working with. Um, often it's about designing a business, whether that's websites, business cards, business plans, and as you know, there's lots of information on how to do that. It could be testing careers. In other words, doing it on a, do it on a, on a basis that's voluntary, working with young kids that need counseling and checking whether it gives you energy. 
um, doing work in your community that might allow you to use the skills you like using and test whether it really is something that you want to make part of your paid work or whether it's maybe part of your giving work. Often it's about cash. I watch people walking out of a job and then finding the bond is due on Tuesday. Um, so often it's about making sure if you're going to be self-employed that you've got 18 months salary in the bank. You know, start working with that or a couple of months. Um, but making sure that you have some resources rather than just jumping in and wondering why it isn't working. It could be about also connecting with people. It could be education. I want to talk about education for a minute because often when people want to do transition, the first thing they grab is prospectus. Now, that doesn't mean you shouldn't do education, but it's also about finding legitimate education that's going to help you. Often education can also just be a way of kind of playing for time. I saw someone recently who was wanting to change their career and they went to see a career coach and came back and said, we've decided what I'm going to do, I'm now going to do a BSc. In what? It was in a, a subject that she mentioned to me and I said, is that what you want to do? I'm not sure what I'll do after then, but it's a good thing to do now. That's just education then that, that is not feeding a career plan. It doesn't mean it's not good, but it simply isn't working for her. The last is to establish new networks. Um, and that takes time. You don't hit a network the day you need a job. You know, I'd really like to connect with you because, you know, my bond payments do and my car's running out. Um, it's, it's a networking in a really intelligent way with people that you can also add value to their lives as well as to yours. Um, and hopefully they'll help you when you need it. I, I want to talk about something different for a few minutes. And, and, and the third thing that I said I wanted to talk about is how do we, how do we kind of make this work, I guess? I do a lot of work in organizations around behavior. We work with leadership teams, we work with organizational culture. Often somebody will say, I'm just like this. In other words, it's my personality. I also have other people saying I'm a CA, like that's a personality type. Um, as opposed to, you know, what can I change? So I want to show you a model that we use quite often, and I think it's a useful way of looking at it, is that if you look at the, the line that runs across the middle, in other words, the horizontal line, many people's behavior towards other people is quite hostile. In other words, they have what we call in, I guess, human resources speak, a low people orientation. They don't get on well with people. They're quite hostile. They can be rude. They're self-centered. It's all about me. You know, ego is quite alive. As you walk to the other end, you have people who are a lot more kinder, who are, understand that the end one was, was the only built for them. Um, and that they, we really can work together to create things. If you look at the, um, the vertical line, many people's behavior is highly proactive. That means they do things, they get things done, they make decisions, they influence organizations, they make things new happen. They always have a plan A, a plan B, a plan C, and if that doesn't work, it says, what are we gonna do now and who's got a you know, kit to fix the tire? It's, it's kind of a natural way of getting things done. But as you move down to the bottom of that vertical line, there are people that spend a whole lot more time in passive space where, you know, they say in life there are people that make things happen, people that watch things happen, and people that wonder what happened. Now, the, the, the stuff at the bottom is people that are simply watching life pass and saying, oh, you know, that's how it worked. Now, that means that people start to operate in different spaces. Each of these quadrants are not personality types, they're not communication styles, they merely are behavior choices. Many people who operate in the top left-hand corner simply achieve things at other people's expense, walk over people, they're parental, they belittle other people, they walk over people. There's a one-upmanship, there's a lot of ego, it's only about me, that means about a solo performance. Not only do they disempower themselves, but they also disempower people they work with. The bottom left corner are people that really do, if you like, sabotage themselves continually in career world. Um, they are hostile, but at the same time they're quite passive, they're the moaners. The people that are always non-communicative, that sulk, that play hate tapes, that rather than playing jazz in their car the way, on the way home, are playing tapes about how the people have done to them, what the government's done, what the workplace has done, what people have done to them, why they'll never make it because they're either of a particular race or a particular gender. Um, so there's a lot of complaining, but they take no action. Um, those are people that if they need to see me, I'll see in the first half of the day, because the second half of the day is not good for them or me. It's simply a space that takes energy. People in the bottom right-hand corner are people that are really kind, really warm, but they're passive. So often very over-positive, often have a lot to say about careers, often have many plans, often don't believe that they have the right to choose what they really want to do. It's, well, this is what I do. This is what I got told to do. This is what I studied. This is what people told me I was worth. 
And I think for me, one of the most exciting part of careers is helping people understand that you do have a choice. It may come with a price, but you have a choice. So a lot of behavior change that's helpful inside of the career world, and I'm talking now particularly about job hunting and about carpet weaving, is that it's about empowering yourself and understanding that you're 100% responsible for your own behavior. You always will be. Uh, you're not responsible for what other people do. Um, you can influence sometimes what they do, but you can't change them. So it's about empowering yourself. It's about setting goals. It's about taking intelligent risks, which doesn't mean walking out on a Tuesday afternoon. It's about an adult optimism that there is a way through. And by adult, I mean it's not kind of a Pollyanna that if you just put a, a sticker on your PC that says every cloud has a silver lining, that things will work out for you. Um, it often takes a whole lot more effort than that. Um, and also a willingness to learn as you go. So what we're helping people more and more is to move into a top right hand quadrant where they start to take ownership, where they start to try things, where they start to, if, if you like, become their own self, their own self managers. I guess we all live in South Africa and I think that, I guess we're here because we want to be here. I think there's some things that we need to let go of in terms of the way we think in order to make career transitions and job hunting and job creation something that's very real. I think one of the things we need to let go of are these macro reasons for unemployment. Now, any of you that have done any studies in a business environment will know that you can probably list them, you know, without thinking too much. Um, but they include things like globalization and skill shortage and capital skill intensive technology and economic growth and job creation initiatives. And it says that because of all of those, therefore, there aren't jobs and therefore it's going to be difficult to find them. Now, because they become so familiar and because they become so overwhelming, one in a sense just believes that that's how it is. Now, if that's true, it means joblessness is going to be around for a long time. The truth is that not only are the macro reasons there, but often the reason is that people simply don't know how to look for work for a couple of reasons. First of all, because they're not sure what they do, what they can do. And I meet many people that simply don't know what they can do to make a contribution. The second thing that happens is I watch people might know what they want to do, but they can't verbalize it, not coherently to a pr prospective employer. So they come with something vague like, you know, what can you do for me? No, well, you know, I've been in the finance area, so what can you do for me? Well, you know, anything around that, that administration, you know. No, I don't know. So I, I think the second part is, is being able to verbalize that coherently. The third is to be able to identify employers that would need someone like you and to be able to identify them. And, and fourthly, to be able to have a, a, a rational conversation with someone that might need you and to keep moving on that. So I, I think there's a danger that we say because there are big reasons. There's, they've almost developed an aura of acceptance, which means we don't have to work against them, and we'll wait for someone to create them. And I think for me that it, we have to let go of the second line that I put in, which is someone else must create a job for me. And I, I really believe that in South Africa we all have a, a responsibility to create work. Uh, it may not be in job form. It may not be by a formal employer. It may not be in a corporation. But I don't believe there's anybody that can't do something of value that can find a way of creating work around themselves as opposed to waiting for someone else to do it. And I think what we do, we may create this dependency that it's someone else's responsibility to create a job so that I can walk into it. Um, and I don't think it's helpful. Thirdly, we need to let go of this well-ordered world of work, well-ordered degree programs, well-ordered career paths, well-ordered positions in well-ordered companies. It, the, the, the job market, the world of work, is simply a whole lot more chaotic than it's been. And chaotic doesn't mean that that's negative. It's incredibly inventive and creative place. But it means thinking differently. It means not expecting someone to design a career path for you that will simply work because you tick the boxes. And just because you have a BCom, you're going to fall in. And I see many of the MBAs, when I say, what is it that you do well? They say, well, I have a BCom honors. So what do you do well? They hundreds of thousands of BCom honors out there, that doesn't make you marketable, unless you can tell me what it is you can do with that for me. The second last one is the concept of agent. I think we have to let go of the concept that someone else is going to do this for me. Someone else will find a job for me, someone else will think for me, someone else will do an assessment and tell me what I should do in my career, and someone else will create the networks for me, and some recruitment agent is responsible for it. We've got to get to a place where we understand that we have to be, in many cases, our own agent. We have to decide what we do and connect with people without expecting someone else to do it for us. 
And lastly, I think we've got to let go of this concept that something will happen. Now, often something does happen. And we hear someone, you know, Catherine says, you know, I was just thinking about a job and just then someone phoned me and said, you know, would you like this? We know that happens. I met someone the other day, a good friend actually, who told me a most amazing story. He got a, a very good contract at an oil company in Cape Town. And I said to him, how did you find the position? And he said, well, I was working in Asia at the time and my friends used to send me bourrevos. He said I was really kind of having withdrawal symptoms. And they used to wrap it in layers of newspaper. And he said I was opening the bourrevos and then the newspaper was the ad. <laughs> now, <laughs> I think it's a really nice story. Um, and he, it was a really good position for him and very lucrative for him at the end of the day. But I think the danger is that we think that if we just wait, something will happen as opposed to making things happen. Um, something might well happen, but it may not be what you want. It may not be in the place you want it. It may not be the employer that you're looking for. And I think we've got to get into a more active space where God does guide us while we're walking uh, rather than while we're standing still. There's a lovely story that John Webb wrote for me in closing about a man who lost his key. And he looks for it in the dark. Oh, he looks at it under the street light. And another man comes up to him and says, you know, can I help you look for your key? And after a while, they can't find it. And he says, are you sure you dropped your key here? And he says, no, I dropped it a bit in the dark, but at least you can see here. <laughs> now, <laughs> often when we, <laughs> when we look at the, at the job market, um, people are only looking where the light is. They're looking where the ads are. They're looking where job creation initiatives are. They're looking where well-trodden paths, but they're not looking in the dark. And I want to read you the end of the, the article written by John Webb, which is a great colleague of mine in Germany. And he ends off by saying, when in a society millions of people find it necessary to look for keys, in our context that's jobs, then it becomes worthwhile to think about the search methods these people are using. Flashlight users are not necessarily the cleverer folks, but they're pretty successful at finding keys. They don't wait for street lights to be put up, they go where they please. And they operate on the theory that the most effective way to look for a key is to look around the place where the key is, even if it's kind of dark out there. I, I hope that if you're considering a decision that you're in one, that it will be a most satisfying and fun and courageous journey for you. Thank you, I hope that's been helpful. Either we went into the wrong field and we don't know what we're doing to get into the job that will give us the money to get to that transition level. Um, although the tools that you've informed us about within the job finders versus employers, is that applicable for us early bloomers or late starters, if you want to call it that? Absolutely. Um, it's interesting that we watch even if, if I look at our children and the things that they do naturally. I think we often just don't plug into what is a natural skill, what do I do, what do I enjoy doing? Um, and I think it's about replugging into that. So it's, it's not an age thing per se, it's just the field that I happen to work in. But yes, you could certainly ask the same questions. Um, and that's why I think when you research jobs, it's about what do you enjoy doing so that there's some kind of correlation between oh, those are the things I want to be doing on a daily basis. Does that answer that adequately for you? Absolutely. A lot of people are looking for careers, jobs in, in new environments and have come from very different backgrounds. From your perspective, when an employer is looking at someone like that, are there good or bad ways of answering questions like, why are you now in this new field? Why should I be paying you more, although you're less experienced than some of the younger people with the same skills that you have now? In other words, are those, how should they be answering those? Yeah. One of the things that, about the employment interview, is having an authentic base of why I'm here and what I can do for you and what I think that's worth. And we're finding that the more people are 
if clear about that and what their value add is. It's simply an open conversation. We often get somebody saying, can you give me interviewing skills? And I'm wondering what it is they're asking for. If you can find what you're good at and you can make a, um, if you like, a, an offer to an employer that you think adds value, that has what you think is a reasonable market value, it's all you need to know. Um, and I think we're helping people do better research so you know what jobs look like in a particular salary field. If you want to be operating in the 70th or 80th percentile, that's okay, but then know what you're bringing that's different and know why you're asking for that. And I think that's a fair question from an employer and certainly one that we would need to answer. I've got two questions actually. The first one is around what you've just been talking about. How do you find out what the salary range is for a job that you want to go into? Mm -hmm. And you know, where do you get that information? And the second question is something you touched on earlier. If you're in a job interview, and let's say it's your first interview, can you actually ask for the job? Can you say, I really want this job? You know, sort of go in like that. Because you said something about um, ask them if, if they need you, and if they don't, ask them to refer you to somebody who does. Yeah, absolutely. OK. The, the salary one um, can be quite sensitive. You can hardly say to someone, show me your pay slip. Um, <laughs> There's, there is more and more information on the internet around them, and a lot of agencies like Quest and the like are providing that. But more, what's more useful is that as you're doing the informational interview, often a question that is more acceptable is, if, if I did want to do the kind of work that you're doing, what could I expect to earn? Or what do salaries look like in this field, or who can you help me find that? So it's not asking people for specific information, but it's getting the range. Often, if you're doing 30 or 40 of those conversations, you typically will work out a fair range to say, well, this range is from five to seven and a half, and I'm going to work out where I think I fit in that. So that's often the way around that. The second thing about asking, I brought a lovely book from the States a year or two back called Ask. And it's simply the power of asking. Can you offer me this position? Are you looking for someone like me? Do you need the work that I do? Um, and it's not about give this to me because I you know, deserve it and want it. It's about, can you give it to me? Um, and often, I think it's giving you a, a more realistic sense of, have I got any chance here? And if not, who else should I speak to? And if you don't get the answer, you're not quite sure whether to move on, come back, phone them again. So I think it's a really helpful question. And we're suggesting that you at least ask one of those questions so that you have something to work with. Lovely advice about what you do once you're in an interview, but how do you get into that interview? And you were talking about um, tapping into the networks uh, for the kind of work you want to do. So say you've identified the kind of work you want to do, you've identified the kinds of companies that do the kind of work you want to do or uh, uh, where you could find a position. How do you actually get face-to-face -face time with somebody if, they, if you can't hand in a CV that they're going to ignore or there's no job ad? How do you get that opportunity? Okay. I was working with retrenchments in Eastern Cape recently, and we got people to draw a chart of all the people they knew, um, with them in the middle, and then there would be one, all the people I knew at school, the people I knew at university, the people I worked with, the ex-colleagues, people through sport, community, church, kids, school, you know, the whole, and realizing how many people we actually know. So often the question is, if I want to speak to someone in that, who do I know that knows someone that can refer me to someone that manages research inside of a particular organization? Also, those interviews are with the people that have the power to hire you. So if this is a standard job being advertised through the HR system, then that's how the game works. But if you're researching and wanting to market yourself into positions that may not be already fourth down the list, then it would be, who do I know that can help me refer to that? Sometimes it's a long shot. And sometimes it's, you might know the receptionist in a larger organization that said, who can you refer me to that works in your finance area that can give me information? Also what happens is that the, the better research you do ahead of a job, you would already have met 30 or 40 people that have given you good information. And often your best referrals are, I, you know, I've spoken to 30 or 40 people, this is an organization I do want to pursue, and I'm wondering who you suggest I speak to. So, you know, Alice suggests I speak to you on, can, could I meet with you for 15 minutes to tell you what it is I can do for the organization in case you need someone like me now or later on, or perhaps you can refer me to someone else. I, I thank you. I, I'm glad you've just touched on the issue of referrals because it was an issue that I was going to be uh, basing my question on. Um, if, 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 okay, there is a buzzword, okay, that is, you know, uh, 
commonly used in our country currently that like uh, there are jobs for pals and uh, you know, how do you differentiate between referrals and job for pals? Can, 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 can that not be confused with refer referrals and job for pals? Can, can you perhaps maybe just, you know, differentiate that? I'm not sure I can. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I mentioned earlier that this is like a dating game. Yeah. So, when the chips are down, we still employ people we like, or people we trust, or people we know that are going to deliver what we want. So it's a, how long is a piece of string? We're going to make decisions. I, th I think where we cross the ethical line is when we employ people who are pals that simply can't deliver, that don't bring value to the organization, that bring an ethic that we can't live with. Um, and I think we're simply then not doing anything useful. But inside of that, we still work in networks. We still employ people we know. And I don't think it's going to change. Yeah. I think it's about finding the kind of people that you do want to be associated with that can help you get to know people that, that are looking for people like you. I, I want to say another thing about that. And, and that is there's an old line that says the, the job that you're looking for is also looking for you. So I think when we're networking, it doesn't mean that we're trying to get something out of somebody. We're bringing something that would help an organization, that would make the country a better place. It's a, it's a gift. Um, and so the process of networking is about how do I meet people that are looking for someone like me? So whether I know them, whether I don't is, you know, is, is maybe a job hunting issue. Um, but then use the networks in an intelligent way, I think, would be my advice. Thanks. Um, Andrew, I really enjoyed your framework about um Sorry, I'm not sure you are. Thank you. <laughs> Your framework with, with the heart. So I'll ask you a question around it. Yes. Um, hypothetically, if Bubba Watson were to approach you and say, you know what, I really like what I do, um, which is playing golf. But um, with it, when I get paid, it introduces the peripheral side, which is um, the French expect me to know what that big tower is, what the arch is, what that really nice place that starts with an L is, and I'm just a redneck, I don't know this stuff. Um, and really the essence of the question is, the peripheral side, once you get paid, does come into the picture, and sometimes the peripheral side, if not oftentimes, we don't really want and enjoy. Mm -hmm. So how would you advise, in, in, hypothetically in the case of Buba, who obviously doesn't enjoy the expectation that he must know all this other stuff. Yeah. Can I ask the two questions? One that you're kind of alluding to but not asking, and then the second one. The first one is about money. Because at the business school, particularly, and I work with a lot of the MBA groups, um, where you'll have somebody saying, you know, this stuff about finding a career you love, you know, is one thing, but we need to earn cash, and quite lots of it. Um, and my answer is always quite standard, is that, you know, when you go to the supermarket, there is only one currency and it is cash. So we all need to earn cash. It's a given. The only question is how do you want to earn it? Um, whether you want to play golf, whether you want to clean cars, whether you want to be financial director of Toyota, come with different packages. And part of the research is understanding what that's about. The second thing relating to peripheral conditions is sometimes a job simply comes with a price. That may be culture, it may be having to know things, it may be relating to people that you don't particularly like. It may mean, as you say, getting to understand a different, different country. And it's a then about making the decision that whatever I do is going to have a price, and am I willing to pay it? I think for me that the bottom line is, if you're willing to pay it, then pay it and move on and do what it takes. If you're not, don't whinge about it. Then decide that this is not sustainable for me, but you may have to give up quite a fat check in order to leave it behind. And so it's this, it's this stage of I can either complain about things, I can accept that every part of life is not perfect and it's going to come with some, you know, filling in a vat form on a Friday afternoon or working with a culture that's difficult for me. Thirdly, I can leave. But that also comes with a price. And I think it's that area of, of self-responsibility, of knowing that I'm always going to have to pay somehow and working out what it is that's okay for me. Does that answer that for you? So work is still work. <laughs> Indeed, for the most insightful presentation. Also, for standing under the light and talking to us from the heart. 
on behalf of everybody here, I'd like to say a very big thank you and a small gift on behalf of everybody here. Thank you so much. To say thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. You can have your mic.